Frozen shoulder is a mysterious condition with a gradual onset of pain in the shoulder and loss of range of motion. This can hamper day-to-day -day life and making sleeping very problematic. Hey everyone, Dr. Zach Greenway, in this frozen shoulder video today, we're going to go over clinical diagnosis, some general facts, pathogenesis, so what's happening at the tissue level. We'll go over the phases and some associated exercises, and then lastly, we'll briefly talk about other treatments. This video is only for educational purposes and in no way constitutes medical advice. A good clinical diagnosis of frozen shoulder is a loss of 25 degrees or more in two planes, such as flexion and abduction in at least 50 degrees or more in external rotation compared to the non-impaired side. Now this is a gradual onset of one month or more that needs to be getting worse or staying constant. You don't get frozen shoulder over one night. Lastly, you make sure you're assessing just the glenohumeral joint, the shoulder joint, and not looking for any compensatory patterns on the scapular thoracic joint. So if the shoulder blade's moving a lot, it may kind of cover up for lack of mobility in the shoulder joint. Now this needs to be augmented with a good history and then potentially blood work and or x-rays or imaging to help rule out other disorders such as post-operative stiffness. Now this is easy because they'll have a surgery recently in their history. Um, osteoarthritis, now this is typically found in older patients. Stiffness typically gets better with motion and it isn't limited in external rotation as much. Acute bursitis can also present similarly, except this will be more of a rapid onset and again, external rotation is not as limited. And then lastly, the most important thing is a posterior fixed load dislocation, which would need an x-ray, and again, there's probably trauma in their history. Some general facts about frozen shoulder. It's most often found in people between 40 and 65 years old. It averages about 30 months, anywhere from one to three years. So again, the expectation is that it's gonna be a process. It's often self-limiting. It's found about 5% in general population, and up to 30% in diabetics, and it's 70% in females. People often have pain over their deltoid insertion on their upper lateral arm. And I found this anecdotally that it really freaks people out because this pain is incredibly sharp and stabby and it makes people worry that there's something more sinister going on. So reassurance is very important at this stage. It often affects the non-dominant arm. There's an increased risk with sedentary jobs. And if you get it on one side, there's an increased chance you'll get it on the other side within six months. Now the good news is once you've had it once on the shoulder, it's very unlikely that you'll get it for the second time. There are two subgroups of frozen shoulders. So there's primary or idiopathic, which basically means we don't know why it happens. It's probably a multitude of reasons. And then there's secondary frozen shoulder, which is after a trauma or surgery. So the pathogenesis or what's happened to the tissue level of this order, it basically in a very simplified version, is that there's an inflammation and immune reaction that increases these myofibroblasts and fibroblasts. And basically these are your little cells in your body that produce collagen and a structural framework. But when this happens for long enough, there's an increase in collagen, which causes a contracture. So the best way to think about this is when you get a cut on your skin, as the scar heals, it kind of pulls the cut towards each other. So that's what that contracture is. I'll we'll talk about the phases. So schematically, there's kind of three phases. Now, each patient will have these delineated out like we're going to talk about, but it helps conceptually kind of understand that there's three kind of distinct components of this. So the first phase is the freezing phase. Now, this is kind of an, an inflammatory process that we talked about. And because of that, there's a lot of muscle guarding. So you'll feel pain and a decreased range of motion over time. Now this phase lasts between zero and nine months, and it's mostly a functional loss at this point. Now, interestingly enough, Holman et al. in 2018 did a study where they had five patients that were about to go under arthroscopic surgery for their shoulder, and they measured the range of motion right before anesthesia and right after. And all five patients in the sideline position showed that there was an increase of anywhere from 53 to 105 degrees of abduction and three of the patients showed an increase of anywhere from 15 to 41 degrees of external rotation. So the second phase is called the frozen phase. Now this phase can last four to 12 months, but again, it's highly variable. Now in this phase, there starts to become structural changes to the capsule. Those fibroblasts that we talked about are starting to increase collagen production. That makes that capsule kind of tighten up like the wound metaphor that we said. So in this stage, it's very important that you're moving the shoulder to tolerance because the pain may start to decrease and like any other part of your body, if you keep it immobilized for long enough, contractures form and that becomes a structural problem. And once there's a structural issue, it's very unlikely that your range of motion will ever increase. The last phase is called thawing phase. Now in this phase, it can last anywhere from four to 12 months depending on the core morbidities. But in this phase, you're starting to see pain greatly reduce and increase range of motion. Now it's important to keep working into that range of motion as 20% of people with frozen shoulders will still have loss of range of motion at four and five year follow-ups. So a common question with frozen shoulder, and especially exercises, is how much pain is okay as it can be a very inflammatory and painful condition. Luckily, a study by Kelly et al. in 2013 was able to quantify and qualify three subgroups. So high irritability, moderate irritability, and low irritability. 
For the high irritability group, they found that anyone that has pain of seven out of 10 or greater for the oral pain scale, consistent night pain and pain before end range, which means that the pain would start before you could go as far as you could and that your passive range of motion was greater than your active range of motion. For these individuals, you should have no pain during or after the exercises. So now we're going over some different exercise options that you can use. Now this first group is probably for the high irritability group. Again, you can kind of tailor it to your current condition. So the first thing you're going to need a broom handle or a dowel, and we'll just do passive range of motion to tolerance and abduction and flexion. Now again, if you're in the higher irritability group, there should be no pain with this. Again, you can kind of tinker with different planes because that shoulder's a ball and socket, so you'll want to try to challenge all the joints to your tolerance. Elbow bent at side, press out with a dowel to tolerance. Another option is just a pendulum swing, so grab a light weight, let it kind of relax your shoulder and distract it, and just swing it in controlled clockwise and clanner clockwise range of motion. Another option is with your arm bent at 90 to do external and internal range of motion to tolerance and again progressing over time. Another good option is just a lightweight bench press. Again, if you only can press halfway initially, that's fine, but just press to tolerance. Another great exercise that's great utility is just a wall push-up. So you can get next to the wall and just do a push-up to your range of motion to tolerance and adjust your feet closer or farther away depending on how difficult you want to make it. And lastly, just some good old-fashioned walking. Walking will make you a healthier human, which will most likely help you deal with this condition better. For the moderate group, their pain was four to six on that oral pain scale. They would have intermittent night pain and they only had pain at end range. So their passive range of motion was equal to their active range of motion. For this subgroup, some mild pain was okay during and up to four hours after the exercises were done. For the moderate group, some exercises you can do is lay on your back with a light dumbbell and you can raise it over your head to tolerance in like a neutral position, palm facing the ceiling position, and then palm facing the ground. Again, you're going to want to go gentle and to tolerance. You can bring your elbow to your side and do external rotation from that position, again to tolerance, and then progressing over time. Another good exercise is having your elbows at 90 with a band. Gently pull your hands apart, keeping your elbows at 90, and raise your hands up overhead to tolerance. From the side, it would look like this. You can also do it with straight arms. And then just gently pulling the band outwards to tolerance here. Hold two small dumbbells with a band around your wrist, elbows to your side, bent at 90, and press up towards the ceiling to tolerance. It looks from the side like this. Again, keeping elbows in and wrist tension outwards. Lastly, some exercises for the low irritability group. Again, you can tailor them to your specific needs. It would be lateral raises, front raises, and then some raises in between because the ball and socket joint, you kind of want to challenge it and stretch it in all the different planes. Lastly, the low irritability group found that they should have pain of three out of 10 on the oral pain scale or less. They should have basically no night pain and their active range of motion and passive range of motion was equal, and they only really had pain with overpressure. For this group, it was okay to have some mild discomfort up to 24 hours after the exercises. And then just doing some hand walkouts to tolerance, so walking your hands out as far as you can, and then back is a great option. Doing some sort of bent over row or dumbbell row can be a good option. Another option is a shoulder press. We recommend using a dumbbell so you have some freedom of movement in terms of how far your arm is back or forward. But again, lightweight, find a position that's comfortable and press up to tolerance. And again, work on increasing your range of motion and different planes that are more restricted. And then lastly, a good option is kind of using a banded distraction. So anchor a band to a door or a frame, bend forward, and then let the band kind of pull your arm up into flexion and let the band stretch you to tolerance. A banded row can be a good option. And then at progression, you can do a banded row to kind of a rotation through the hips. And then a banded press can be a good option as well as pressing and rotation. Early, combined with PT, it was superior to PT alone for short-term follow-ups of pain and function up to six months. There are two other treatments, manipulation under anesthesia, where the person's put under anesthesia and then the joint is forcibly adjusted and then caps are released. 
Now these may be applicable for some patients that have been unresponsive to conservative care, but there are pros and cons and potentially adverse effects, so they should be weighed with the patient. Interesting enough, there was a paper done in The Lancet in 2018 that compared people that had corticosteroid injections with PT, corticosteroid injections with manipulation and anesthesia, and then corticosteroid injection after surgery. And they found no clinical difference in outcomes at two-year follow-up. Thank you so much for watching our video today. We really hope you found it helpful. Feel free to email us at info at per sport and spine or leave a comment below if you have any specific questions. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you found it helpful.